It is so special today to have Nathan and Brooke with us. They can say their surname. Um, I, I did, when, when they uh, first came on board with us last year, we had a video and I, got, I called Joel and I said to him, can you tell me how to pronounce the surname? And then I, I, I must, we must have done about four or five takes of that part of the video as I tried to get it right. So I'm not going to butcher it this morning in honour of you, um, but it is so good to welcome you guys. Uh, when we were looking last year as a church, um, we've, we've got our missions that we support in the Philippines and then also local missions. And we're really looking for um, a new um, area to support. And we um, came across Nathan and Brooke, uh, who are serving in Sri Lanka. Um, and it just has been a great fit as we've uh, spent some time with them, got to know them. Uh, they fit so well with us and us with them. And so it's going to be awesome to hear from them and about what God's put on their heart, what God's doing um, through them in Sri Lanka um, and how we as a church can support them. So let's put our hands together for Brooke. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here this morning. Um, it's nice to meet everyone or well, some of the team on Zoom, but how much better is it to be in person? I think we all, I don't know about you, but did anyone else get Zoom fatigue last year in lockdowns? I was like, I'm over Zoom. Anyway, so it's so good to be here, to be in Canberra. You guys are so blessed in Canberra. I love it down here. I've probably, well, it's probably my second time really down here. And yesterday I was like, I'm walking around Lake Burley Griffin. And I just was walking around going, this place is stunning. It's so clean, isn't it? And walking around the lake, Okay, so in Sri Lanka, when I walk around the lake, do you know what I have to be careful for? Crocodiles. There's signs that say, caution, walk, watch for crocodiles. And especially in the rainy season, because it's around Parliament. So I think they actually did put crocodiles in there to protect Parliament. I don't know. I heard that story. I don't know if it's true or not, but it sounded good at the time when I was in Sri Lanka. So I just went with it. Anyway, so at least yesterday I didn't have to watch for crocodiles and I was in a days just saying how beautiful um, Canberra was. So it's awesome to be here with you this morning. So about me and Nath, we've been married how many years, Nath? 13, 14 this year. Don't forget it, hey? We've got two kids. Um, Bella is eight and Malachi is five. And for me personally, um, missions has been something on my heart for such a long time. Even before Nath and I got together, I my heart was just to serve God and to love God and to do whatever he asked of me. And as a young Christian, I always just thought it was, you know, serving in church and picking up rubbish or cleaning out the toilets after youth would trash them on a Friday night. And it wasn't until a bit later that I really felt um, the call to nations, but I never thought that God would use a girl from Newcastle that didn't grow up in a Christian family. I just thought, ah, that's for somebody else. And, and it wasn't until Nath came along and obviously started dating and Nathan had a heart for Sri Lanka and I thought Sri Lanka I hadn't really heard of Sri Lanka it was really bad I actually part of me thought oh God might call me to Italy because I thought I love coffee gelato pizza pasta what else is there to love you know not um what heat curry what else do we love about Sri Lanka <laughs> patience it's such a test in Sri Lanka if anyone needs your pace your patience tested come see us come to Sri Lanka it's you know it's amazing um, but obviously there was a time and then we got married had kids and um, it was probably 2017 we just really felt in God that 2019 would be the year that we would go to Sri Lanka and I'm so thankful that God not only spoke to Nathan he spoke to me as well separately so we both had this confirmation that we knew that 2019 was the year and we felt to go in June 2019 just to work out with the whole schooling and do you know what happened in 2019 in Sri Lanka? I'm not sure if you know but Easter Sunday weekend um, there was a terror attack that took place in Sri Lanka and they attacked um, Christian um, churches and they attacked hotels and it was the first time in Sri Lanka other than the civil war that we had seen terror attack happen there and that same week that that happened we actually signed our house to be sold in Newcastle to be going to Sri Lanka and I just thought God what are you doing you've called us to Sri Lanka and now there's a terror threat and this has happened and many lives were lost and I felt the Holy Spirit say to me you know Isaiah 54 verse 17 no weapon formed against you shall prosper and I had to come to that place of real peace and real trust in God before we went over there but you know when we got there with the kids and 
when we left, Malachi was in diapers, like he was in nappies. So I thought, oh my goodness, this is, this is going to be interesting. And if you've ever been to Sri Lanka, it's, it's a little intense. It's a little crazy. The airport, you literally, Nathan and I kind of look at each other when you land the plane and it's like, quick, grab the bags. You want to get to customs because you could be there for a few hour wait. And when we landed, because of the terror, there was, do you know what? Our flight was the only flight. I couldn't see any foreigners. And I thought, oh, this is going to be interesting, God. I'm like, what are you doing? But anyway, so we went with it. And the first few months in Sri Lanka, it was all about connecting and getting used to a new culture, um, new language, different food, trying to sort out visas and get kids settled into school. And I remember the first day dropping the kids at school and because the threat, the terror threat was still there, so it was still really high security. So we'd drop the kids at school and there'd be army officers with machine guns standing at the school gate. There'd be special forces going through and doing bomb sweeps of the area to make sure that um, the kids were safe before we dropped them at school. Just because um, other than churches getting attacked, schools were actually on the terror attack list. But thankfully it didn't happen that they... Yeah, the attack happened on a Sunday when kids weren't at school. Um, so it was really it was really tough, like having to trust God to to let our kids go and to get them settled into the country. And it was, yeah, God was so good. Even though in my flesh I was like, oh, gotta let them go, God. But he just he was like, Brooke, I've got your kids. I love your kids more than you love your kids. I'm gonna protect them in this nation. I'm gonna look after them. And it was just, it was a real um real peace for me to be able to feel settled and to trust God in that season and I feel like that whole the two years that we're in Sri Lanka God was just like trust me Brooke keep surrendering keep trusting me and in that season we had the kids settled in school and we were uh, attending local church we were meeting with some pastors um, with some churches that we were connecting with and we had a venue in mind because initially we thought isn't it funny how you think that you know what God's calling you to do and then God just you know, just changes a little bit because we thought initially we we're going there to to plant the brave church, and and then COVID hit, and COVID changed the whole scheme of things. And in that season, we did a little bit of content online, and we did some trivia nights because we were all locked up. And in Sri Lanka, when I say locked up, you you can't actually leave when you're in lockdown for food, or you can't leave for an exercise. So we were in our apartments um, for three months. We thought we were going in for three days. So I think I did a shop for about a week and then I started panicking when we got told it was an indefinite lockdown. Um, but God is so good. I don't know how we made it, but our groceries just kept going. It was by um, grace, uh, God's grace and goodness. And then we had food trucks. So it was like a bit old school. We'd have a truck turn up and we would have to go down to the apartment and line up and buy our food from a truck. So you never know what was going to be on a truck or what you were going to eat. You just had to go and line up and be creative, didn't you, Nathan? Be creative and, you know, make sure the stash of lollies would last. You know, the kids and you're bribing them because you're, you know, trying to homeschool your kids. That season was a fun season. It was very stressful. Homeschooling for 18 months in Sri Lanka, that was very, um, that was very interesting as well. But in that time, um, we felt the Holy Spirit say, stop don't worry about building your church. I want you to build into the local church in Sri Lanka. I want you to come along and support the churches. And in that season, Nath was able to help um, some local churches with filming and getting their church services online and helping them to um, edit and do all those technical things that I have no idea about. I'm like, great, Nathan, you can do that. <laughs> I'll encourage you and support you along the way. And, um, and also before COVID, isn't it funny how God just lines things up? On my heart, I had to do, I felt some mentoring. And so I started doing some mentoring training myself with um, some mentors back in Newcastle. And we started um, mentoring a, a senior pastor and his wife, who are part of the AOG in Sri Lanka, and the national youth director as well. We started them on this mentoring program. And it's kind of taken shape that they they were doing it for a year. And now we're working um, with a mentor to create a program that we can take back to Sri Lanka just to really help pastors and leaders and it's all about pastors health and leaders health because that's something that in Sri Lanka um, they, don't have, they haven't quite taken that time just to pause and reflect and if you're a pastor in Sri Lanka there's so much pressure you have to be Joel I can see Joel's nodding his head I think he understands you have to be at everything you're at everybody's wedding funeral you're at their hospital bed you're at anything that 
it's kind of like the pastor is nearly like a God. So it's just trying to teach pastors about um, just having that Sabbath, having that rest. It's okay to have time with your family. It's okay to have a holiday and just their overall well-being. And it's something that I'm really passionate about and seeing that change in some of the leaders. And the, our, one of them is our brother-in-law who's the senior pastor. And he's just like, it's changed how I do church. It's changed my mindset. He's like, it's made my marriage healthier. And I'm like, and that's the kind of thing that we want to sow into as well as, um, yeah, seeing God's church being, yeah, being built. And initially we'll start in Colombo because that's English speaking. So it's easier for Nathan and not, well, for me, Nathan can speak singular, um, to connect. And then we'll start changing the program to adapt it to um, Singalese and to Tamil and we are to take it out station, which is like out into the regional and rural areas to the um, pastors out out in the um, out in the country. So it's it's been a journey these last two years. It's learning, we've learned, well, I've learned, I'm saying we, but you know, for me, I've learned a lot just to really let go and to really trust God and the scripture, which I'm sure you all know, and that I've just really had to cling on to is Proverbs 3. Um, five to eight, it's trust in the Lord with all your heart. Where it's, you know how you can go, yeah, I trust God, but it's in those times when you really are tested. It's like choosing to trust God, lean not on my understanding. And my understanding in Sri Lanka and everything was going crazy. I kept going, God, what are you doing? What are you doing, Holy Spirit? But God makes it, doesn't he? He makes, he turns it all away. He leads our path and he makes it straight. But God is good, isn't he, church? Yeah. God is good. I'm going to get Nathan. He's going to come up and share with you a little bit more than, yeah. I'll let you keep going. Thank you. I don't have a Sri Lankan accent. Um, um, in Australia, everyone thinks of me as a Sri Lankan, and in Sri Lanka, I'm think, thought of as an Australian, so it's a confusing time for me. Um, so I was a, started my first missions in Sri Lanka in 1983. <laughs> So I'm old. I was a three-month-old. I was really good at missions. <laughs> um, so I've, my family were missionaries in Sri Lanka to start with. So I lived on the missions field till about 1994. Um, and in that period, I lost my father. He was um, killed while um, speaking with some of the leaders that he had trained up in Bible college. Um, so it was a kind of a rough journey as a missionary's kid. And if you know what Sri Lankan culture is, um, the culture of a pastor and then the pastor's kids. I mean, Australia has the same thing with pastor's kids, you know, it's a, there's a bit of pressure, but there's an extra extent on it. And then if your father was died, died as a martyr for the thing, there's even a little bit more extra pressure on you. So it was very hard growing up in it. So I left Sri Lanka and I didn't want to go back. I was good riddance to it. Um, but just before we left, I had this um, little bit of a, like a vision and God just saying, you know, you will build my church. And I'm like, good on you. <laughs> All right, done, let's go. And I left um, in, in Australia and I just came, went to church, started serving youth. Was a bit of a, um, um, a rebellious kind of kid, you know, I always wanted to try and push the boundaries and always have a bit of an argument with my youth pastor and my pastor, but I always loved God. Um, it wasn't until uh, later on um, that, like, I was in my 20s where God just really just went again, you're going to build my church. Um, so, and I, if you get prophecies, okay, I'm a pastor because I've grown up getting pastors speaking in prophecies and when they go, you're going to build, so you, you get this mindset that this is what I have to do and it gets very um, challenging and when I met Brooke and we had this heart to go, I'm like, okay, God, we're going to go, we're going to plant a church because this is what's been told and, um, and when we felt the time was right, we went, um, when we told our senior pastor at the time, Mark, we said, we're going to go to Sri Lanka. And he's like, yep, I feel that's right. It was two years before we left. And at that point, I knew that God was just going to bless us abundant, abundantly. And we were just going to have the best two years going in. And then we were going to lead a church of a thousand probably in the first three months of Sri Lanka. Um, it was the hardest two years before we left. And we're like, what is happening, God? Like, I said, yes. We said yes to leaving the country. It's gotta, you've got to be like looking up. Where's the hookups? And um, it just got really tough. And, it, you know, it, it put a lot of stress and strain on marriage and just belief and everything like that. And you know, when we got there, we're like, okay, now, God, you're going to do this. And um, then we were, you know, from the bombings into COVID, I'm like, how does this work? And um, it was really tough. Um, but in this, what we had, I had to learn, like, I had a heart for Sri Lanka. I had this thing where God said, you're going to build my church. So 
in your mind, you go, okay, Sri Lanka, build my church, I'll do this. And that's how I'm going to build. Um, but then when COVID hit and we were in lockdown for three months, kids are going crazy, like Brooke said, and it's tough. And um, I just had to, had to kind of sit and go, God, what am I called here to do? Like we're sitting stuck. We're not doing what you said. We're just not feeling right. And um, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to share kind of what I felt was the core and then what I felt was like how, how it happens and what we do. And um, I'll just preach to myself because it's about me. And if you get offended, don't worry. It's, I'm offending myself. Okay. Um, but um, so I just wanted to really just share our heart and um, I guess what we're, in, what we're going to be doing towards the next few years in Sri Lanka, this is kind of what brought it around. Um, so I just asked God, you know, how am I called? Like, cause I, I'm keep getting confused about call. And so, um, I just had to kind of, I did a little Bible search and, you know, just started studying the Bible. And the first thing I knew was that we're called to salvation. We were called to come back into relationship with God. That's his first draw card. And, um, and in that, we are called into freedom and in, into hope and holiness. And I went, okay. So I'm not, because I always thought, you know, your called is, I'm called to be church pastor. That's the call, be a part or be a preacher. But I was like, okay, God, we're called to salvation first before this. And they're like, okay, God, what's the response that we have to have? And the first thing I learned was that we have to have a responsible responsibility to live faithfully. And in Ephesians 4, 1, 2, it says, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of a calling you have received. And I love this part. It says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. And I love this part. It says, bearing with one another in love. It's really hard when you're in lockdown and you're bearing with one another. And like sometimes in church life and everything, there's this thing of, you know, there's frustration and people have difference of opinions. We learned that through COVID, especially in Newcastle. It's all the crazy people there. And, um, like, and they're all our friends. And um, so, like, we, you know, we had to learn to love people, even in these hard moments of different opinions and, and just go, you know what, it's about humility. It's about trusting God. It's about loving people and first coming into relationship with God. And Second Thessalonians says, uh, one, verse 1 to 11 says, With this in mind, we constantly pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling, and that by his power he may bring to fruition every desire for goodness and every deed prompted by faith. And this is where I learned, like, we have this thing. It's calling to God. He's called us to him first. We are in relationship with him. It's about becoming in Christ. And as we do that, there's this heart. I had a heart for Sri Lanka, and I have a heart to build a church. And I really just believe that as we continue to grow into God and start to just be in Christ, the desire that your heart has is what he lets you be released into it's not the thing that sets you and defines you because christ defines you um but we go and the heart's desire is to love people because he's called us to love people he's called us to build the church it's a part it's just a desire and i realized that i've got to take my the pressure off myself of being the person who has to build this and make it happen to go by staying christ and be in relationship love people that we can move into um just doing what god's called and that's in sri lanka the great thing, what, what you learn as well, is that we're called to suffer. And um, isn't that exciting? Can I get an amen? Like, I want to, let's give it out here. Because <laughs> that's what, especially in COVID, it says 1 Peter 20 to 21 says, but how is this to your credit? If you receive a beating for doing wrong, it's, it's fine. If you do something wrong, you get a beating and endure it. But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his footsteps. I just realized that, you know, like when we go, oh, God, what? I should be getting blessed. Why is this happening to me? Is realizing that, you know, Christ did the same kind of thing. Like, I'm pretty sure he didn't want to get nailed to a cross. And he had those moments, but it was to endure through everything that we go through. And let God be God in your life and let Christ be the center. And I learned that if we're going to have a divine calling and trust God, there's the three things that for me was it's salvation first, that he's called us into salvation. And then it's to learn to live a holiness of life. Um, and that's not trying to be super spiritual. 
but it's just being in Christ and understanding his heart for people, understanding his heart for you to have a better life and freedom. And he brings us with assurance and hope. And um, this was the big thing for us is um, insurance and hope. Because when you're, when you're in different situations, uh, and we've all gone through situations, it's the questioning of why or how, what, what's going to happen next. Um, and I was reading um, some, a book by Dr. Um, Boa, and it's on Romans. And this is what, I'm just going to read him. This, this is not me. I'm not that smart. But um, this is uh, someone else. And I'm just going to read just a little snippet because um, this is really what, for me, is missions. And this is why we will go and what, what, why we do what we do as, a, as churches. And when I say we, it's not just Brooke and me, it's you guys, because, um, you know, we just feel so honored that you guys are actually stepping in and um, being a part of it. And it just makes us, we're just like a hands and feet of your church. And uh, everything that we are doing in Sri Lanka is what you are doing in Sri Lanka. And, um, you know, you can go, you know, this is what we've done. We do this. And you know, we've got a crazy person over there just struggling in lockdown. Like, <laughs> you can tell people that's yours. Um, you're, you're struggling too in Sri Lanka, so <laughs> it's fine. Um, and this is what he says. What can separate the believer from God's love? He says, nothing can separ separate the believer from God's love. Um, this is talking about Romans 8, 31 to 39. He says, Paul unknowingly or knowingly takes the, on the prophet's mantle um, in, a, in verse 36. He quotes from Psalms 144 uh, to 22 to demonstrate that there will be always opposition to God's people and the work of God in the world. The world is cursed. It is antagonistic environment. It is under the control of the evil one. There will be many natural and supernatural attempts made to convince the believer that he or she has been separated from the love of God. Paul knows that nothing can separate us from the love of God, but he also knows that it can appear that we have been separated from the love of God. He wants to dispel both of these notions. Paul himself will become like sheep to the slaughter. Within a few short years, under the brutal hand of the Emperor Nero, um, Paul, he will be killed. So he was a man of unshakable faith, confidence, and love of God. He feared nothing the tangible hardships of life, nor the intangible fears that creep into our minds and our consciousness. Anyone ever had these things? I am su why am I suffering for a reason? Is there something happening? What if I wake up on the other side of death and discover I've been fooled? What if I do not wake up on the other side of death? And where will the love of God be then? You know, we all have these different questions when we're going through something. And guess what? All normal people have considered these questions. And Paul is just bold enough and confident enough to get them out on the table and answer them. He wanted the Roman people to deal with these situations and these questions, but he also wants the third millennium believers to deal with these as well. So his answer then and his answer now is that nothing will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ, Lord our Jesus. In that time when um, this was happening, when Paul was writing to Romans, like um, Emperor Nero was a pretty crazy guy. And um, he started a fire. No one knows, but blame him for kind of starting a fire that killed a, um, destroyed a lot of the land so that he could build his palace on it. People were upset with him, so he blamed the Christians who were rising up, who were a small sect and said that they were the ones. So at that time when Paul wrote this, in the four years after, like after there was four years where the Christians were slaughtered, um, they were used as torches, they were made to fight, they were fed to dogs, and uh, they were going through this destruction. And if you know Roman history, Roman, Rome was one of the greatest empires. It spread across the world. All right, so, and in that time, they were conquerors and builders. Um, so when Paul was writing, going to the Roman people, right then there, you are more than conquerors. He said, you're more than what the Roman Empire is. It would be like the same thing now. You'd be like, what God? Like, you know, when you can, it's trying to think that how can we be more than conquerors? And you're having these questions. And that's, these are the questions I had in Sri Lanka. I'm like, God, what, what are we doing? Like, how can we do what we do? Like, and God said, no, you got this. And, and to trust is hard when you're, faced with situations but if you look now in the world and you look for the roman empire it's not there but if you look in the world and you look for the christian church it's everywhere they were more than conquerors even if they did not know they were conquerors and um that was the thing i had to learn was that you know sometimes right now we can feel like we're not conquering 
right now we can feel like we're not taking ground or there's something in obstacles in our way and it's going to be too difficult. But know that God is more than a conqueror and that his um, ability to take what we do and multiply. When my father was killed, he was in ministry only for two years um, in Sri Lanka, like, he, like where he actually kind of had a missions call. And then he was the Bible college teacher. We wanted to plant a church in New Orleans, which we started in the hill country. We moved up there. And then he went while the um, peace time was. And he went up to meet the Bible college students that he had. He'd only done like a few years. And then um, while he was there, he was assassinated um, by the terrorists. And you can go, oh, God, what do we do? Like, what's going to happen now? Like, it's over. He's dead. His dreams are gone. Um, and to this day, like, so it's, over 30, 30, 32 years since he died. Um, right now, in that area where he died, there's multiple churches. Throughout the city, wherever we go, we hear of pastors who um, went through war, went through struggle, but stayed the course and just really just loved God and loved people because of his example. Um, and so for me, it was to learn that, you know, it's not about me being someone special, but it's about me loving people and loving God. Uh, for us, our heart is to build a church, but we realize our heart is actually to change a nation and to love people. And that's why our heart is to do mentoring because we want to really now get alongside pastors who are struggling right now. We've had a pastor commit, a wife commit suicide during COVID because she had no food to feed her kids. Um, so our heart is to get alongside and say, you're more than conquerors and, and to help them believe that they can keep going through and there is hope and that his assurance is good on us um and um it's for us as well and i I learned through this that you know what no matter what we're going through god you've got this it might not be the way i want it to go but you've got this Uh, and so for us it's just learning not to worry about the church and we know god's got a church for us and we will build the church but right now we're really focusing on just helping pastors and we've started by um just helping pastors with their wages. So we support about 10 pastors at the moment that are getting um, monthly wages. Um, and as, as we can, we, and funding comes through, we keep on increasing that. And at the same time, we're just getting alongside and just saying, how can we help? How can we be here? And our heart is to really just grow the local church and to really build. And we're going to, I go back in, in February, second week of February by myself. And there I'll be um, starting to connect and meet the team and start to look at the team that we're going to use to train for the mentorship this year, as well as um, looking at one of the local church plants of um, starting in the city. And for us, it's because sometimes you think, I was like this, geez, I've got the best vision. God's only really spoken to me that he wants to plant a special church that only I can do. And then when I got to Sri Lanka, there was five other pastors had the same vision as me. And I'm like, and they're like, oh, tell us how you're going to do it. I'm like, I don't want to tell you how I'm going to do it. But like, then you're going to do it. Like, but then, I, you know, and there's that little competition thing. And I, you know, God was like, no, no, tell them how you're going to do it. And if they want to do it, you support them. <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay. And so that's what we're going to do. We're just going to, as much as what we know, we're just going to hand it to them. And we're going to let the local church be built as well. Um, our heart is to see that nation transformed, to see pastors and families succeed and have good marriages. And, and I just wanted to read this. For you, um, because for me, this is for everyone who goes through things. You know, this message in chapter eight is, it's for those who are in Jesus and there's freedom from condemnation and all its attended fears. You know, there's a new life that is guaranteed for us from God. And the big thing I had to learn was I'm free in Christ. I'm free from condemnation. In Christ, I have met the righteous requirements. In Christ, I'm obligated to be led by the Spirit, not by head. Uh, In Christ, I am a child of God and staying in Christ. In Christ, I am certain of my eternal glorification. And I do not fear anything in or out of this world. And we had to come to this thing of, you know what? I'm just going to let God be God. And I'm just going to stick in Christ. And Psalms 91 and 23 talks about being in his presence, not saying go and do things. It just says, He'll take you and he makes you have rest. He makes you dwell in, the, in his presence. And that's what I love about church. This is a place where you come to find rest. This is a place where you come to learn to be in Christ and grow. And that way when we're out, we're actually leading through from being in Christ and rest. And this is what I just want to read because this is my biggest thing for why we do what we do. And it's the Romans um, 8.31. 
13, and I'll finish with this. It says, what then shall we say in response to these feelings? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us. He will, how, he, how will he not also, along with himself, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Jesus Christ who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine, nakedness, danger or sword? It is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him, through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. And that is the thing that I have assurance and hope on. And that no matter the struggles we're going through, no matter what we're doing, hey, buddy, that, um, that we just have this assurance. And it's the same for you, church. I just want to encourage you, whatever season you're in, whatever situation you're in, just know that as you are in Christ and you rest in him, he has, he has you. And nothing can separate you when we feel like we're distant. So that's what I felt. I felt like, where are you, God, in this moment? And he said, I'm right next to you. Nothing can separate. No lie can separate you. I'm always with you. I am for you, and nothing can come against you, and we are more than conquerors. So I hope that's all right. I just wanted to encourage you with that. Um, thank you for having us, and thank you for supporting us and being part um, of the journey we're taking on, and we're so excited to just be partnering with you and making this thing happen together. Awesome. Thank you. Brooke and Malachi, won't you come? We're going to pray for you guys. Oh, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for Nathan and for Brooke and for Malachi and for Bella. Lord, we thank you for the heart that you've put in them. We thank you for the call upon their lives. Father, we thank you for the way that you, uh, your timing is perfect. Lord God, that you uh, placed them in Sri Lanka at exactly that time for your purpose. Lord, we thank you for the way that you've shaped the vision. Father, for the way that they're able to sow into local pastors and in doing so, local churches. And in doing so, see um, the, the, the call that you've put on their lives just amplified and magnified as, as people come to know you. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would um, continue to sustain them. Lord, as Nathan heads back in a couple of weeks' time, Father, we just pray for protection. Lord God, we pray for open doors. Lord, we know that you go ahead. And so, Lord, we just pray for them as a family, particularly as they'll be um, apart just for a season. Lord, we just pray that you would and bind them together. Lord God, that the distance won't feel quite so far. Lord, we just pray your blessing upon Bella and Malachi as well. Lord God, as they um, serve alongside mum and dad, Lord, that you would draw them close to you, that you'd be uh, sowing into their lives this great uh, heart for you. And so Lord, we just pray your blessing upon them. In Jesus' name, amen.